So hi everyone, we're just um, we're just sorting uh, cable adapters, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> um, so um, while we're doing this, uh, so my name is David Rogers, I'm the Fraud and Security Group Chair at the GSM Association, uh, which is a, a global industry body uh, that that looks after all of the mobile network operators uh, in the world, uh, plus all the sort of surrounding ecosystem. Um, I've um, I run a company called Copper Horse, which uh, does loads of like cool security research stuff, uh, mainly around um, protecting kind of future future products and uh, future uh, solutions and so on. Um, the uh, yeah, the, what you probably might have heard me about me from was uh, the code of practice for IoT security. Uh, so the previous speaker mentioned IoT. I'm not going to talk too much about IoT tonight. Um, and uh, I think we're we go. So, um, but um, but yeah. So um, I did speak at 44 Con in 2018 uh, about the code of practice, and that has recently been passed into law. So uh, at the back end of 2022, we got royal assent, and um, we uh, the PSTI, the Product Security and Telecommunications Act, uh, Infrastructure Act, uh, went went into law. And then the regulations just the other day, this week, uh, have been finalized and put into law. So from the 29th of April next year, um, it will basically be illegal to sell insecure IoT products. And we started with the top three things, so no default passwords, mandating of, um, a vulnerability disclosure policy so that uh, security researchers could contact companies, and also uh, transparency around software updates. Um, I'm hoping in the future that we'll move on to the the whole lot of that code of practice um, because it's pretty much the fundamentals for product security. Um, it does have some relation to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, um, yeah, but I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> so, um, I told you some of this, but um, I, I own this company called Copper Horse. Uh, I also own interest in car hacking. Um, so, I have my own car hacking rig and I also do sim racing on that, which is pretty cool. Uh, come and see me afterwards about that. Um, and um, I also grow grapevines. And I can, pr I can proudly say, uh, um, thanks to Josh Corman, um, that, that I'm a, an award-winning uh, um, winemaker as well now. I won 20p at my local village uh, fate for my hacker wines. Um, thank you. It's my proudest moment, I can't be honest. And um, if you have a look on Twitter, you can see the whole thread of my day, um, from waking up after a night at the pub uh, to uh, getting third prize. Um, and um, yeah, so um, Drop Table uh, is, uh, is a, an award-winning wine. Moving swiftly on. Um, so coming back to the code of practice, actually, um, I was trying to think of something that you probably already hadn't heard about. And on the day of the launch of the code of practice, um, the, guys, the guys in the government were a little bit miffed because they were knocked off the top spot in the technology news that day by Snapchat ads filters for cats. So I thought you'd find that interesting. Um, clearly, clearly, that's bit bigger news, to be honest with you. Um, and as we know, the uh, internet was built for cats. Um, so, uh, so, the GSMA stuff that we do. So I've been kicking around the mobile industry for a very, very long time. I was the head of security. Well, I set up the product security function at Panasonic Mobile years and years ago. And we would basically Im investigate embedded systems hackers, work out what they were doing to our products, and then try to foil them before they, they uh, created some tools for it. Um, this is all before the days of um, firmware over the air. So, you know, it was a pretty difficult task, to be honest. But um, we did learn a lot in the process. and. Um, you know, largely, uh, if you heard these stories before, I mean, really, it comes from the, the car radio hacking scene in the 90s through to the SIM unlocking and IMEI hacking scene that back into the 90s. And then that evolved into the late 2000s, into the jailbreaking and, um, and routing scene. And um, some quite sophisticated organized crime groups also grew up in that time. Uh, so when we were investigating this kind of stuff, we'd find all sorts of other criminal equipment, fronts to cash machines, uh, car hacking stuff, and, and so on. Um, so that was where I came from, was doing hardware security and software security for mobile phones. 
And then I got involved uh, with the GSMA to do with some uh, mobile phone theft issues. And um, at the time working at the manufacturer. And that led to a lot of joint industry work on making the next generation of secure phones. So what became the trusted execution environment in devices, um, there was a hell of a lot of industry involvement in that and, and uh, it was a great, great project. Um, I ended up becoming the device security group chair um, and then ultimately my current role, which is the um, overall fraud and security group chair. So we have a number of different subgroups, uh, one that covers roaming and interconnect security, uh, so that's when, um, you know, Vodafone UK would say want to connect to China Mobile. So, you know, all of these uh, connections don't just happen. It's not just magic. They have to go through lots of different intermediaries. And there's some security negotiation between. And um, there's just a hell of a lot of complexity. Even just to make a single phone call is a hell of a lot of complexity. And because of that complexity and because there's charging involved, there's a lot of fraud involved as well. So a lot of the work that the Fraud Security Group does, surprisingly, is anti-fraud work. Um, I, do, I do think we should probably change the name at some point. Uh, but, you know, um, so we generally have this kind of combination of, of monitoring security intelligence that's coming in from the network operators about, you know, things like um, Simbox, uh, uh, issues that are kind of spreading around the world, or particular new types of fraud that network operators haven't seen, so they share that intelligence amongst them. Um, we have to deal with mobile malware. Um, back in the day, if anybody recognizes that thing up there, my thing's not working, um, the, the blue box at the bottom there, you know, so telephony in itself has been targeted and we can go back years and years and years, we can go back to, to prehistory probably. Um, but particularly telephony, telephony is interesting for lots and lots of reasons. Um, and at the moment, I guess, one of the reasons it's interesting is also because of legacy. So we have been a victim of our own success in terms of um, uh, digital uh, mobile communications. So a phone call that you can make today, you can make on GSM, which was designed in the early 1980s. Um, that's both a blessing and a curse for, for me. Um, and um, you get to work on a lot of cool different technologies, um, but also we've got lots of problems with lots of different technologies. Um, and because it's global in nature, it becomes very, very complex. So I, I talked about interconnect, um, but you also get like kind of hyper local frauds that are particular to one region or particular to one particular country. Um, so one particular interest I have is in something called virtual kidnapping. Has anybody in the room heard of virtual kidnapping? One person. Um, so yeah, we will be publishing some work on that soon. Um, but it's it's an issue, particularly in Latin America, spreading to, to the US. Um, and uh, that, that's just one example of a particular type of fraud that's localized to, to a region and is a big, big problem for users and for, uh, for networks. Um, the same with, um, I guess, market, market distortion type situations where for example, you might have a country that charges loads of tax for incoming phone calls. That kind of generates a, a sort of a healthy ecosystem for fraud. Um, and um, so uh, a lot of people move in to do things like uh, international revenue share fraud and, and, and other interesting things. Uh, so you end up finding things like SIM boxes down wells and uh, hidden away. Um, you'll see we've got the phone hacking scandal there, uh, so that's to do with default voicemail pins uh, hanging around for ages. Um, so, so right across this whole massive sphere, uh, we have to deal with that. There have been some in incredible hacks, um, and um, you know, the, over the years, uh, I've, I've built up a hell of a lot of respect um, for for some of the people involved um, in the hacking community, both. Uh, both the good guys and the bad guys, to be honest, because um, I think some of the, the criminals, you know, if they turn their, turn their eye to normal business, they do very, very well as well. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's what we spend our time doing. So we kind of like have to um, both face forward, looking to the future. So we're looking at how we design future networks. So you're thinking about 6G and so on. Uh, we think about future challenges, so things like post-quantum and things like that. And then looking backwards, we've got to deal with all that legacy. So. Um, it's, it's a huge challenge, and we'll obviously always live with legacy. So that kind of um, 
attack surface is absolutely massive for us. And although we've got, I think, about 2,500 people in the fraud and security group, um, plus all the people that work in their organizations, um, we still don't have enough people to deal with the issues that we face. Uh, and there's a hell of a lot of smart people. And I'm going to talk to you about some of those um, kind of uh, smart uh, people that, that have been involved um, with, with some of the reports to us. Um, so, in the past, how would we deal with, um, say, uh, something hitting the market that a uh, security researcher had presented at DEF CON um, or, or uh, you know, disclosed in some way? And well, it was very, very ad hoc. Um, it was pretty much about who you knew and, um, and whether they'd answer the phone at a particular time. Um, often, I know that security researchers would basically get you know, they try every route possible. They try to contact the customer services of a company. They get nowhere. Uh, they'd be on LinkedIn trying to contact people. They get nowhere. There was this prevailing attitude, which I still see in some places, about, um, you know, you can't talk to hackers and you're basically talking to criminals and so on. So people were scared, even if they wanted to talk to them. Um, so people you know, some of the hacking community built up personal contacts in the industry that were friendly, and then they maybe put, passed them on to somebody else. But it was incredibly ad hoc, and um, it was pretty damaging. And again, we're coming from the days where there was no way of patching mobile devices easily. Um, so if there was a vulnerability, it was probably going to stay there. Um, uh, it wasn't really until, properly until, uh, you know, Android and iOS came, came along that, that we started to get a bit more mature about these things. Um, so you'd have, you know, a quiet chat with somebody in Corridor Con, you know, that would happen. But again, it's just like, it just feels really, really ad hoc. And I often use the reference of um, Bernie Eccleston, who complained about Silverstone, the Grand Prix, and he said that it's, it's, it's run like an English country fair. And, and I, felt, I felt that quite strongly in certain areas of the mobile industry, is that because it's kind of grown up really rapidly, we're still doing things that are inefficient, they don't help people, and they, and they take ages. Uh, and we're kind of trying to sweep away those old ways of doing things because we simply don't have the time to, uh, to, to be able to uh, go and wait for the next meeting in the next quarter, stuff, stuff like that, you know? Um, and to speak of the devil, so we do have uh, these quarterly meetings, which are sort of plenary sessions, so that um, we have the separate fraud and security group uh, at the time. Um, and that still goes on, you know, but, but um, it's not the best way of dealing with zero day. Um, and I mentioned about the direct contacts, but I'd, I'd get people contacting me through my blog as well or um, through email. And then the other side is, is the sort of reactionary side, which is the companies going, have you seen this article? And then it'd like spread like wildfire through the industry, and then someone would try and speak to the researcher. Um, but that's after the event, and it's probably after the consumers have been hit. Because what happens generally, and what we have seen, is almost immediate exploitation of issues that, that, that come out, um, particularly in, an, in a domain like this where where we're the mobile industry, so it's chargeable, so the fraudsters are, are moving in on, on vulnerabilities that they see. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so we um, wanted to, well, I'll give you the background, right? So we had all these individual submissions to companies that often went nowhere. Um, and then what happened is there'd be a hacking conference and there'd be a particular issue that it turns out that every single manufacturer knew about, or the ones that bothered to read their emails or to answer their security researcher. But they didn't bother telling anybody else in the industry, and they didn't tell their customers, the network operators. So all hell breaks loose in the press. And again, nothing's been patched. So why didn't they do anything? Why didn't they talk to each other? Um, and the, the moment of sort of personal annoyance for me, but there were, there were many more, but it was at um, CCC in 2010 uh, when Colin Mulder and Nico Gold did uh, SMS of Death, hit uh, multiple manufacturers. Um, obviously, um, it, you know, it, it didn't kill the device properly. It didn't kill it properly like the, the iPhone one, um, but, it, but it affected many, many mobile uh, devices. 
and cause them to restart and so on. And it was, it was a very simple issue, it was, you know, but it was also simple to execute as well, and that was the key issue there. And every single manufacturer that were listed already knew about it. Nobody in the wider industry knew about it, and nobody did anything about it. So in 2011, 2012, I started to look at um, whether we should sort of mandate, if we could, um, bringing uh, CVD to or vulnerability disclosure or responsible disclosure at that time uh, into, say, every mobile network operator should have it and every manufacturer should have it. And it, we kind of got started to get somewhere with that document, but then we got a little bit of resistance. And then it started turning to something else, which was maybe the industry as a whole should have CVD on the behalf of everybody, and what would that look like? Um, it took ages. People didn't want to do it. The same old thing about not talking to hackers, and you're basically sort of educating, you know, educating all the way along, um, and then it go a bit further up the chain, and they wouldn't understand what vulnerability disclosure was. And then bug bounties came along as well, and it's like, is it a bug bounty? No, it's not a bug bounty. So, but things do take time in industry. You're talking about trying to get every company, in every, every mobile company in the world uh, involved. And uh, of course, that takes a lot of consensus and a lot of agreements. Um, but by 2017, cut, cut the story short of it, we managed to get this program together. So basically, an industry-wide CVD scheme that any security researcher could come to um, if, the, if they were having problems and if it was a cross-industry issue. Um, I still, uh, I found one actually last week in the medical world, um, but I don't think there's any other industry, and please tell me if, if you find one, that, that has this kind of uh, CVD program. And maybe it's because we're kind of unique, because the commonality, because it's completely standardized through FreeGPP and Etsy, means that, um, it, you know, each of these individual companies are essentially doing the same thing in a lot of cases. So um, there's a bunch of benefits for industry and consumers. You can tell this is a GSMA slide. Um, but yeah, good stuff. Um, so the scope of the program is, is obviously stuff that's not in previously in the public domain, but that's the case for most CVD schemes. And we do reject stuff that we know about, and has been known about for many years. Um, but the key thing is it's not got to be for a single vendor. If it's a single vendor, um, then you go to that vendor. It's got to be, um, you know, across uh, multiple types of technologies or standards uh, based technologies uh, from multiple suppliers. And so some examples there would be obviously the, the mobile networks themselves, the signaling protocols, uh, the SIM, uh, again, multiple manufacturers there. Uh, and authentication key agreement protocols, OAuth 2, all the stuff that, that we're using to interact with a mobile network. Um, so, so, yeah, so if you are thinking of doing some mobile security research, then obviously we're interested. Um, but, of course, please go to, if you, if you find a vulnerability in a particular vendor's piece of kit, go straight to them, go find their security.txt or slash security. Um, um, go, and, go and speak to them. If you're struggling to find them, then you can come to the GSMA and, and they'll try and help you with a contact. So don't feel afraid to, to, to contact if you can't, can't find somebody, because you've pretty much got everybody in, in the GSMA. Um, now, more recently, we encouraged 3GPP uh, and Etsy to stand up a CVD program, which is quite interesting. I would like to see more usage of this in standards bodies, because we all know that there's gaping holes in certain standards. If you look at um, certain RFCs as well that are almost unfinished, uh, OCSP, um, you know, th there are, um, you know, there's a great need for standards bodies to actually take um, these issues seriously and to actually fundamentally deal with them. And a lot of our work does actually go back to, to standards. Um, so it has to be industry-wide. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of examples of this to, to kind of help you along, but also to kind of do a bit of show and tell. Um, and then we have this panel of experts. So um, th there's about, th th obviously they don't look like that. 
well, not all of them, um, but that we've got 24 panelists and they're all world leading experts, they're all really well known. And they serve a two year voluntary ter term and they're tasked with triaging um, all of the submissions that we get and very, very deeply technical stuff. And what we do, we kind of like spread it across certain expertise. So we've got a couple of guys who are the, the SIM specialists and then somebody who's a, a specialist in, um, you know, air interface cryptography or something. Um, so we, we really try to find that balance and we also try to make sure that it's global um, so that we're getting different perspectives on things and also that we're getting the contacts around the world for things that we have to investigate. And, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so how does this work? So um, we have this panel of experts and then they will also speak internally to the GSMA but whilst keeping the confidentiality of the actual uh, the actual submission and then at the end of the process as well they'll, they'll issue an advisory internally and work with those different working groups to say well what are the specs we need to change in GSMA or what, what guidance do we need to be changing and so on um, and there's a bunch of other groups this is just some examples here um, and then crucially they'll liaise with the standards bodies as well so they'll send a liaison statement it's a bit archaic um, but they'll talk directly, and a lot of some of the members of our advisory committee are also uh, in those standards bodies directly with that, that expert knowledge. Um, and so what we're doing is, you know, not only are we um, responding in the 90-day the period, but we're fundamentally addressing the issue. And I think that's the, the key benefit here, is it's not just a software patch to get around an issue that is caused by standards. We're actually going back to the standard and fixing the standard. And we recognize the importance of that. Uh, we also have this uh, TIZAC organization as well, which is a, um, for, for automated intelligence sharing as well, which is, is quite handy. Um, so yeah, of course, we're, we're working with uh, various universities and so on as well. So on to some kind of interesting stuff here. So um, I picked out a few CVDs that we received. So this was the first one that we received from the Unicorn team at 360 Technology in China and um, presented at Black Hat USA. And um, this particular uh, vulnerability um, is one that we, that we sort of, I want to say, see all the time, is, is, a, is a problem of generations. So bidding down type attacks, we call them. So bidding down attacks. Um, where by ha having to kind of interface with the old technology, in this case, going down to circuit switch, switch technology from packet switched, um, vulnerabilities are introduced because of some protocol mistake or basically having to tolerate the uh, insecurities of the older protocol or not being able to pass information through because there's no, uh, you know, the older protocol doesn't even know about that new stuff. So it's very, very complex. And um, what you find with these type of, type of bidden down attacks is, so you mentioned, uh, 2FA SMS, it's often a target, right? SMS is often a target and it's increasing target because of 2FA SMS. So, um, so also universities like to go for that one because it's a big one, right? Um, so these types of attacks we, we do see and, and um, it's great when, when people come to this with this and this, this was the first one as I say. Um, what we also often find with these, these kind of disclosures is there's a lot of kind of, in this circumstance, if you do this and this, and you're near the victim. So we have to kind of do a risk-based analysis on it as well in terms of like really, is this a really a practical attack? So it's a bit of back and forth with the researchers um, to discuss that with our experts. And I guess some of the negatives to that is it's almost like free consultancy for the, <laughs> for the security researchers because they haven't quite found the solution to what they're looking for. But there's a lot of good faith between both sides and um, you know, everyone's trying to work out what's going on. Um, what we also see is a lot of misconfiguration. So the standard might have got it right, um, but then when it comes down to implementing at the operator level or, or in particular areas where the network's deployed, there's been some kind of mistake um, or certain, steps of, certain sets of circumstances that should be turned off are not turned off. Um, and um, so these guys, uh, so David Ruprecht and Merlin and, and uh, Christina and so on, 
Um, they, they've done a huge amount of great work in the mobile space. And uh, this one was presented at YSEC 2019. And this was around operators that were deploying insecure 4G network com uh, configurations. And the good thing there was that they were working with a mobile network operator, so they had the access. And this is one of the biggest problems for security research in mobile, by the way, is access. And we are working really hard, actually, to see what we can do in the future to provide access to security researchers. Because obviously, if you provide live access to a live network, a live mobile network, you can take out a country. And that has actually happened. <laughs> During a pen test from one country, from one country's network, they took out the whole of another country. Uh, and um, it's, not, it's not fun for that company that does that. Um, so um, there's a lot of initiatives going on right now, actually, around testing mobile network equipment and so on. And I'm hoping to see sort of more sort of ranges and stuff for mobile telephony. Um, so in this case, they were able to create a tool as well that other network operators could use. And we were able to get the word out really, really quickly and go, right, sort this stuff out now and, and put the mitigations in place and actually fix your configurations because this is ridiculous. Actually, we also tightened up the LTE and 5G standards to kind of reduce the scope of, uh, you know, people making those kind of configuration errors. Simjacker you might have heard of. Um, uh, it's similar to some earlier attacks that were in 2013. Again, um, so... Uh, binary SMS, so sort of silent SMS type stuff. Um, but the kind of interesting thing here is that and not a lot of people realize, so obviously a SIM card's basically uh, execution environment. It's got a, Java, a version of Java on it. And, um, and so in this case, uh, the SIM Alliance had defined something called the SAT browser, which was on quite a few SIM cards. And... So what that can do is you can execute stuff in the SIM toolkit and you can tell the phone to do stuff and it does it, including opening the browser and going to a URI, <laughs> which is a bit mental, to be honest with you, uh, in this day and age. Um, but uh, the, the, the interesting thing about this one was that Adaptive Mobile, who are a security company in the mobile industry, they actually saw this being actively exploited in the wild. And um, it's difficult to, it was mainly in Latin and South America, and it's difficult to know who the threat actors are, but you can see from the type of stuff that they're trying to do that it probably is spyware or, you know, some kind of private um, actor in that space. So it was quite a uh, big um, sort of reaction to that in, and uh, working closely with the SIM Alliance to actually make sure their security specs were was sorted out, but also specifically in turning off the SAP browser. So the good thing was that you could actually turn the browser, the SAP browser off remotely in the SIM card as well. Um, but in some cases, I think it will have led to SIM replacements. So all the SIM card vendors are involved. And I, I don't know any other organization that would be able to kind of get, get all those stakeholders together that quickly and deal with it. Um, but um, yeah, stand on it, we did. Even more fundamental, so this goes back to the sort of legacy question that I was telling you about, is um, legacy encryption algorithms, particularly on the air interface, so the bit between the phone and the base station. So one of the problems with GSM, now, not in the 1980s, this wasn't a problem, and I'll explain why. So um, we, didn't, we didn't have mutual authentication in GSM because the network was always trusted, <laughs> because the network was usually owned by the government. There was, you know, privatization was only starting to happen around that time. So there was some real, like, misassumptions in the design process. Um, and, um, you know, bearing in mind, we're also coming from an environment where there was no encryption on the air interface and people could listen into analog phones, right, on, at least on one side of the call. But this stuff is still deployed now. It's still available now. I can still attach to a 2G network. And this, again, is a problem for us because when, so when you hear about false base stations and stingrays and so on, what they're generally trying to do is pull you back down to 2G. So they might try to jam the, the LTE network and force you back down to 2G because then uh, there's no mutual authentication. And so that false base station could pretend to be the network and, and fool the handset into doing things. And it can request different types of um, encryption, encryption algorithms. So that's really the attack here. 
is that if I can pull it back down and I can force the, the phone to use GEA1, then actually I can brute force that. And what they realized was, as well was that they could actually um, uh, break it really, really quickly. So we, this is again the benefit of, of the network operators. The network operators actually went out and started to survey the networks and said, like, how many devices on the network actually support GEA1? And started to get some statistics. So then they can start to understand what, actually what the risk is here. Now, bear in mind that we'd already pulled GEA1 from the specs back in 2013, 2012 or something. Um, none of the handset manufacturers should have been producing chipsets and, and phones that actually supported GEA1 anyway. And also then, we'd already moved up to GEA4. GEA3 was, was defined in 2002. And GEA4 um, is, is what people should be using now. But actually deploying it is a problem. So deploying it you know, on legacy networks that never get updated can become a problem. And it's not just a simple case of a firmware, a firmware update. We can do firmware updates on devices, and, that, and that's the chicken and egg problem. It's also for deployment. So this actually also, the same with the A5 algorithms as well, is this lack of crypto agility is a weakness for our industry. Um, and it's something that we'll have to make sure that we change in the future, and we, and we have done that. But we're supporting all this legacy that just really, really is difficult to get rid of. And that's where some of these weaknesses come. So obviously, this is like a fundamental flaw um, with the GSM specs. And um, obviously, there was a big reaction. There was, there was a lot of, I mean, the, the, the number of researchers that were involved in this work was incredible as well. Um, so the advice now is that all network operators should be using, moving towards GEA4 and deploying it as soon as possible, but they should have turned off GEA1 and all the handsets should have turned off GEA1 as well. Um, so this is an interesting one as well. And this, this is um, where researchers are kind of confined to their home network, for example. So in this case, it was in China. And it was presented at a security conference before it was sent to us. <laughs> Not great. Um, and they sent it in, and they said, OK, so we can spoof RCS messages. So RCS is a it's kind of like next generation SMS, right? Let's just call it that. Um, by injecting into an insecure TCP connection, and they referenced these uh, particular uh, TCP vulnerabilities. Uh, so one was a side channel attack, and the other one was about um, blinding window attacks, which is an RSC for. But this wasn't a flaw in the GSM specs. It wasn't a flaw in the, in the mobile specs at all. Um, this is a problem with the server deployment architectural decisions and you know, w whether it was properly configured and so on. And, and so th this is, again, this is sort of another example of this type of stuff that we see. So um, it was accepted because it, was, it enabled us to kind of put into our, our requirements documents that you must ensure <laughs> that you actually avoid these types of attacks. Uh, and we tightened up the RCS standards as well. So that's why it was accepted. But it is frustrating to see that basic issues in... Um, in deployment of new technologies where um, you know, best practice and security isn't, isn't, isn't covered, is, it ends up in, on, our, on our table. Um, this, is, this is one, so CVD-46 um, is an interesting one because um, this is actually a sort of collusion attack. So this is actually where a, an attacker um, that wants to do 4G interception um, tries to steal the authentication vectors. So an improvement in LTE in 4G was a, a tighter binding between the home network and subscriber and, and, and uh, how you were able to authenticate that network. So that if somebody tried to roam in as an attacker, they couldn't do that because they didn't have the authentication vector from, from that local device. But then subscribers roam as well. And so in this case, the attacker 
also has access to a roaming partner, so uh, maybe an IPX provider. But they're also doing a local attack. And the combination, so what they're trying to do is request the authentication vectors from the core network and then use that in the attack on the false, uh, using the false base station. And um, quite worrying, to be honest with you, we did actually already have the countermeasures de defined, but once again, some, some of the network operators hadn't deployed them. But also, there were some things that we needed to tighten up, so you can't, can't be mass requesting um, you know, PLM and, PLNM IDs, for example, uh, on the signaling network. So a lot of the stuff that we're seeing and a lot of the stuff that we're shutting down is actually related to I guess sort of what would class as sort of spyware type activities, um, but they're not, it's not always spyware. It could be commercial stuff where they're doing location lookups and stuff like that as well. And then um, fast forward to June this year when we published this one, I think. Um, so uh, this was from Pennsylvania State, Penn State. Um, they submitted uh, a bunch of vulnerabilities all related to OAuth 2, but all related to network slicing. So network slicing in 5G uh, allows you to say, I want more availability in this slice, or I want to have, I've got an IoT device that only sends a message at every 24 hours or something. So it allows you greater flexibility in, in how you divide up your network. Not many people have deployed it. And this is actually the good thing about this, uh, this CVD. Because what we're getting to now is not only we're dealing with a lot of legacy issues and shutting them down, but we're also hitting the future issues before they actually become issues. So because the specs are uh, still um, being updated and so on, and because it hasn't been deployed, we're actually fixing these issues ahead of time. And so the current state of that is, is a liaison statement has been sent to 3GPP to um, close down those ambiguities in the spec um, and to uh, close the gaps that would enable an attacker to exploit um, those particular attacks, um, which, again, they're not as straightforward. Like, I'm, I've simplified it on there, but you wouldn't find it easily. And I think that's testament to the researchers who've worked on this, who've looked at in very, very great detail about what would happen if I, in this particular circumstance, did this, and then I changed to the no another network slice. And I think the reality is, is that the people writing the specs just don't have that level of time to consider those kind of edge case scenarios. And that's where, unfortunately, we fall down. Um, maybe AI will sort that out in the future and close all the non-deterministic bits, I'm not sure. So um, there's a process, <laughs> right? We go through a process, we try to keep it under 90 days. But as you can imagine, like loads and loads of companies um, collaborating, coordinating, it is, it is a very uh, a complex process. And, um, but the good thing is, because we have this panel of experts, because we've now done 77 um, CVDs through the process, it's pretty slick. And actually, all the companies are kind of ready for it as well. So they understand what CVD is. Um, we have this acknowledgements page. You can go down and have a look at it and um, search for it. Um, uh, I would like to improve it. I, I would like to see a bit more about what the actual vulnerability was that was dealt with. Um, mainly, we're getting them in from universities. And I would like to see more security researchers who are doing interesting stuff actually submit. Um, it doesn't have to be all universities. you know. Um, and there's a lot of stuff, interesting stuff out there to be found. Um, and I think, as I say, I think um, in the future, we would like to maybe set up uh, kind of mobile test beds and so on, and the UK is looking at, for example. So to be able to have security researchers look at a kind of virtualized mobile network and actually play around with it would be a very, very good thing. Uh, one small thing here, which is uh, purely semantic. Um, some people get mixed up with CVDs and CVEs, and they're like, GSMA issued me with a CVD. <laughs> It's like, no, it was just an assigned number. It's not, it's not, an, it's not awarding you a CVE. Um, uh, it's just literally the number that's recorded for the next one. Um, but I, I recognize the fact that people, 
you know, do see this as a badge of honor, and, and it is, because, um, you know, a lot of CVDs do get rejected as well uh, in the early stages, um, uh, simply because there's stuff that we've seen before, and you, you are dealing with, with, you know, a lot of experts. So, um, GSMA kindly gave me some stats, um, and it hasn't shown me the technology types there, but I think, um, I think the blue, blue segment there, the larger blue segment is RAM. Um, I think the uh, orange one is core, I think. Um, and then the gray one is UE, uh, so the dev devices. Um, so, yeah, so that's just this year. Um, and if I just say that all these CVDs take a long, long time to, in, in terms of labor, there's a lot of labor involved in actually analyzing uh, what's going on and actually going away to your, to your network and actually looking at what's going on. Um, I think overall it's broadly uh, stayed, stayed about the same. Um, and um, yeah, we've generally kept very, very close to the 90 days, even in like the very severe ones, like I would class Simjacker as a very severe one. Um, and um, yeah, I think some people don't like me saying this, but I think actually for the industry, there's clearly been millions of dollars saved here because we're getting ahead of the security debt and we're getting ahead of the technical debt that would come later on when somebody did abuse that. Um, but obviously it's difficult to quantify. Um, but more importantly, particularly on the private spyware issue, is we're making it a very, very collectively, the security research community and the ac academia and the mobile industry are making it a very hostile operate, uh, um, operating environment for private spyware companies to, to um, play in. Uh, and there's a number of different actions we're taking there. Um, just digress slightly, on the 31st of December this year, uh, we will actually ban the subleasing of global titles. And so for those of you who don't know what that is, that's pretty much the main entry point to get into the signaling network for spyware actors. And there have been a number of cases where that's been the entry point, and we're basically not tolerating it anymore. It will be difficult to do, um, but we're taking that action, we're taking a number of other actions. Uh, you'll see uh, that Google and Apple the other day announced that they're um, enhancing their um, safe modes on their uh, phones and um, denying uh, access to certain networks in lockdown mode and so on. It's exactly the right thing to do. And there is a collective of, of all of us, I think, that, that find this absolutely unacceptable. And I can assure you that I'm making, made it my top priority throughout my chairmanship to, to prevent that and to continue to fight it. So, digression over. Um, so, what we generally see, the, a lot of common themes in these submissions that I've mentioned, so network operator configuration issues and deployment, um, bidding down attacks to get it back down to 2G or to, to some generation where they can execute an attack, uh, legacy protocol abuse, we didn't really go into the signaling stuff, but SS7 particularly, because uh, there's not a lot we can do to fix it, that's the problem, there's no integrity protection, there's no confidentiality protection. We're, we're sort of saved by signaling firewalls. Um, undefined behavior in standards, and I would like to see really a lot of work across different standards bodies, including the internet standards bodies, to, uh, to clean up the RACT, um, because, because that's definitely a solvable problem. Um, abuse of trust, um, so for example, between networks, you know, uh, on the uh, roaming interface, or, um, you know, I guess, I guess the answer to this, some of this is zero trust, but then I also have a view that you should have zero trust in zero trust. But, um, so we're dealing with all this stuff across multiple organizations and technologies, and um, it's working quite well. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, that the one benefit is that those network operators can actually go and test this stuff. So as a security researcher, you can kind of almost set an exam question for these and go, well, what does it look like in the rest of the world? This is what it looks like in the network operators I've tested, but clearly there's an issue here. And the operators are quite happy to go and check it out because they're worried that their network's exposed. So I mentioned about what I call the Yanis problem. So we have to look forward, have to 
deal with all future post-quantum issues and the apocalypse. Um, and we also have a look back to the legacy. Now, we've seen some stunning research work come through, absolutely amazing work, um, but clearly uh, there's a lot of bodies buried out there, a lot of insecure deployments across the world, and we really, really need a lot of help. Um, now, one positive is obviously all the things like in the UK, for example, we have the Telecom Security Act and the what we're called the TSRs, but the, uh, the code of practice that goes with that will go a long way to making the UK mobile networks are much safer. Um, but that's just one country. Other countries are looking towards that, by the way, as a, good, as a good solution. And the GSMA has set a baseline security standard uh, called FS31, which essentially uh, you know, says a lot of the same things, really. Um, and we want countries to kind of mandate that. We want networks to op uh, adopt it. But it's hard, and it's complicated, and it's expensive. And legacy will always be an issue. So the event that I went to this morning was about open networks and the government was launching something and they were asking about ORAN security and AI. And the problem is, is that when we launch 6G, 4, LTE will be legacy. And there'll be vulnerabilities in LTE that we with tools to attack it that we never knew about now. So we'll always have legacy. 6G will be legacy at some point. So we have to learn to live with it. And there are different strategies that we can, coping strategies that we can, can use to deal with it. So um, we just have to accept that, I think. Um, but what I would like to see with 6G, and this is really goes against the grain of what the, some people want, but as a security person, it's what I want, is I do not think that we can continue down this path and continue to, to maintain everything back to 2G. You've seen the issues that, that come up. So all of that technical and security debt, we can't carry forward. And I'll give you an example. So in 2030, that's the date by which we have to have a defined 6G standard, right? Lots of reasons for that, but 2030 is the date. So by about 2035, we'll be deploying the first 6G networks. So what happens in 2038? Does anyone know what's happening in 2038? Go, go to the microphone and, and tell everyone. <laughs> it's not on, I don't think. Oh, someone's turning it off here. Ah, it's on. It's the Y2K bug, bug again. It's when the 32-bit um, integer rolls over from 1970. Yes, we have an integer overflow flaw. <laughs> Um, which is the uh, Linux epoch bug, bug. So starting at first the first 1970, it will go into negative. Now, there are fixes for that, by the way. But think about all those IoT devices that have been deployed now. Think about all those SIM things that are out there. You know, the projections for IoT are in the billions. So it could be a real problem. And the decisions about 6G are being made now. So now we absolutely have to think about 2038. Now is 100% the time to think about this. So my view is that actually we need to have this kind of logical break for 6G. And we may have to have interop back to those legacy things, but we need to protect ourselves for the future. And now is the time that we have to make that decision. So. With that, um, thanks a lot. I hope it was kind of a little bit interesting and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.